Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Advantas with Brian Burris. We're going to talk today about zero trust security in semiconductor manufacturing. Brian, when you think about security in manufacturing, particularly in a, in a large fab where they're doing a lot of different uh, processes at once, a lot of the, the security tended to be perimeter-based, right? That's correct. Uh, you depend on the IT of the facility to create a secure environment for your software and hardware. And so what's changed? So what has changed is there's a, a new model to kind of look at the situation called zero trust model of security. And this provides some advantages. It changes the way you have to think about um, architecting and deploying your services and equipment. And the benefits of it is that if there is a data breach or a compromise, it prevents its spread and the damage done and the cost. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Brian, what are we looking at here? This is kind of a high level view of our deployment into a manufacturing facility. So down here is more of the uh, manufacturing or test floor level. There is a data center level on premises. And then beyond that is the cloud. And really what you're trying to do here is what? Control the flow of data and make sure that there's no, no corruption along the way? That's correct. We're trying to protect IP and we're authenticating and encrypting at every node connection along the way. This becomes harder because you think about tests in the past, it was pretty much one, one step of many processes and it was in one place. Now test is being scattered all the way through the manufacturing, right? That is correct, and you need to share data from one facility to another and from one insertion to another insertion in the process. So it becomes very difficult to manage that flow of data securely. What happens when something gets compromised or you get corrupt data within there? You've now got lots of different processes and lots of different vendors coming in here. What, what do you do? Yeah, so there's a zero trust model of security. You can apply these principles to any of your deployments and architectures that you put in such an environment. And what this helps do is uh, reduce the spread of any breach or corruption that can occur. And zero trust came out of the Department of Defense, right? I mean, isn't that the original place that it started? That is correct. And they have a, a series of standards and, and guidelines on uh, how to follow such a model and what are the uh, top principles in such a model. Really what you're, you're seeing here is that everything now has to be secure. It's not just military equipment, it's commercial products as well. Some of those are mission critical, some of them are safety critical too, right? And expensive. Some of our customers have spent a lot of resources and time developing complex analytics and they want to protect their IP. So they want to know when they deploy into our systems that it is secure. What prompted all this? Because military we understand, but how about in the commercial area? Yeah, our customers are starting to have concerns because they're operating in the same space as their own competitors. And so they do not want to share maybe these complex and these analytics that may give them an advantage that they've spent so much time developing. Part of this is, is the shift toward what more heterogeneous uh, architectures where you now have multiple chips or chiplets inside a, a package? Yeah, there's heterogeneous architectures as far as the, the chiplets, but also the different number of vendors and chip manufacturers that participate in the same shared environment. Is there one standard that applies to all the different equipment and uh, processes that are in a fab? Yeah, there are many standards documented under NIST. Um, NIST is not a uh, set of directions, though. Uh, you have to find out what are the best industry practices for performing all of the usual security controls. Who's driving this? Is it the, the foundry or is it somebody else? It's the IP owners, the ones who have a stake in protecting their data and IP. And so for, in order for them to be included in a product, they now say, we want our IP protected? That's correct, and they need to cooperate with the vendors that are putting their products into manufacturing to make sure that they comply with a certain set of standards for security. What's the impact on manufacturing? Does it slow it down? Does it make it harder to, to uh, install your own software there to be able to see how things are going? It's a good question. The requirements are difficult. It doesn't necessarily have to slow anything down, but it does add complexity to the development. 
So this is all done up front before you even get to the manufacturing, right? The best way to do it is to start from the beginning of the conceptual phase of product development. Where does this go wrong? And if it does go wrong, what do you what do? You do? Hopefully it doesn't go wrong, but of course uh, there's problems with any system. So you at least have some traceability into what happened and how it happened and how you can prevent it in the future. And so the traceability all relies upon the same kind of data too, right? That's been one of the big problems is that everybody has to be working with the same data, the same data standards. Well, traceability is part of the set of principles such that you have observation and knowledge about what is happening within your environment. And this may include um, who are the participants, what is their authentication, and if there is a breach, how did it happen and what was to blame? One of the problems with traceability has been the fact that not everybody wants to share the data about what went wrong somewhere along the way, right? So you think about uh, defects, that's been a problem where the, the traceability data has been difficult to obtain all the way across down the line. But when you think about security, it's a whole different matter. So data provenance is a really complicated question since there are so many parties and vendors that may handle this data at any point in time. And so really the IP owner needs to uh, cooperate with the vendors to come up with a, a satisfactory solution. Does it get harder now because you're now dealing with multiple different pieces of IP that potentially can go into a package as opposed to just we're going to shrink to the next node, we know where every step is? Yeah, it's, it's more difficult because now you have multiple IP owners all wanting to protect their IP, maybe even from each other. So those are questions that are difficult to answer. The stakes are higher all the way across. I mean, you think about uh, where chips were used in the past, it was pretty much in a computer or, or a smartphone, which was what, what the bulk of them were. And if something broke, it really didn't matter. You move to a, a vehicle where you're now doing with airbag deployment or, or the AI system that, that runs the car, it's a whole different uh, level of security that's required, right? How does that filter back into this? So absolutely. I mean, there are financial problems, but as you pointed out, if uh, devices are compromised and these parts end up in production and in your consumer parts, your cars, this could become a safety issue as well. And that's when you go back to the standards. So there's high le higher level of standards for processing devices that end up in things like cars and airplanes. Also, the traceability has to go back to where the problem actually arose, and sometimes that isn't so clear. You think about things like silent data corruption, it turned out to be a defect in the manufacturing that caused it, as opposed to everybody thought it was software. So how do you share that among all these different vendors where you have IP that is now coming in from multiple different vendors? Yeah, so as far as silent data corruption, so I think at a high level, that's a little easier to detect because it's not malicious, it's more of an accidental uh, corruption. Whereas uh, malicious, you're actually defending against uh, one or a group of targeted, skilled individuals, which is much more difficult to defend. And it's even more complex than that because now you have to think about potentially sleeper cells that may come out years later. They may, not, they may be dormant until somebody triggers them with some sort of code, right? That's a good question because that brings up the idea of data persistence, um, which leads to the whole reason we're doing all of this and trying to integrate this into the cloud in a secure way is that this allows us to save more data and scale and provide any number of years of persistence. And that how long you keep that is dependent upon the application and also the vendor that needs it, right? There are, actually, there are also standards that determine things like how long a, a key can be used or how long you can keep data. One of the big challenges in a fab is that not all equipment is brand new. Not all of them take advantage of the latest standards. How, what's, how do you deal with all the interactions of new versus old versus not so old? Absolutely, much of it can be quite old actually. So we had an opportunity at Aventest to develop a new product and call it ACS Edge. So we considered some security during the initial phase of design of this product. And so it was built in from the beginning, which is much easier than trying to retrofit an old existing product. Sort of like renovating a house versus building a new one. It's much easier to do it from scratch, right? That's a really good analogy. How much of a challenge is it to get 
an entire ecosystem behind this because really it's not just one piece of equipment it's all the things that that work with it it's the customers that you're dealing with as well as different data types that you're dealing with too absolutely and this is a huge challenge for an equipment provider like advent has so what we do is try to find and seek out partners and third parties that have the proper accreditation and we use them to help us design and do penetration testing and evaluation of our security in the lifespan of this, are we just at the beginning of where we are need to be with security or have we progressed to the point where it's really good at this point? I think as far as the entire integration, we're still early on in the ramp. And in terms of what that will ultimately bring, you think it will actually solve the problem or is, it, is security always going to be more of a process than a solution? I think as far as the process goes, coming up with a set of standards for our industry is really key, but the process will continue, of course. Brian Buris, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.